What is it that makes some Christians stink? <laughs> now, I don't mean that they don't use deodorant. <laughs> I don't mean that they... But I mean, why is it that some Christians are just like stinky, stinky cheese? They're like old fish. I mean, they have an odor. I mean, there's nothing pleasing about their lives to God. You get around them, the things they say, the things they do, it stinks. You've seen this. Can I get an amen or an oh me? You've seen it. Be on Facebook. The stuff that supposed believers of Jesus Christ will type onto the computers is awful. The stuff that supposed believers of Jesus Christ will say out loud holding a Bible. This is blah, blah, blah. God believes this. What? I mean, just it stinks. I mean, and you know it. You smell it. You go, are you serious? Because that doesn't, that doesn't smell right. <laughs> that doesn't smell biblical. That doesn't smell like anything Jesus would say. It stinks. And at the same time, you know, Christians, that the shine, that just shine like the sun, I mean, I mean, shine like sitting on the porch in the middle of summer and just, you know that, you know, like when it's hot and the, just the, the sun is on your face and you can like feel it. Like, I don't know how the sun gives you vitamin D, but you can feel it happening, right? You're just like, this is amazing. What, something is happening. Like I am like being warm through my skin to my bones, like the sun. And there's some Christians you meet and you get around them and they warm you, don't they? You know some Christians like that, don't you? Do you know some Christians like that? I hope so. I mean, I, I really do hope so. I hope you have the privilege and honor to know some believers in Jesus Christ that know how to shine and they don't stink because we have enough stinky cheese. Amen? We do. We have enough stinky cheese. And so this is the question that we're going to deal with tonight. We're going to deal with what is it that can help us to shine? To shine. And let me just, let me give it all away. We're going to talk about what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And let me just give you again, this is it. Followers of Jesus Christ shine. They don't stink, they shine. That's my sermon. It's the whole thing. Which I'm going to elaborate. All right? Followers of Jesus Christ shine, they don't stink. Let me just ask you, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes. Are you a disciple? Yes. <laughs> Are you a disciple? Yes. Okay, I'm a, I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not tricking you. I'm just, those are the same thing. Let me just say, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a disciple. Disciple is a more intimidating word because it in, implies discipline and doing things that are hard for Jesus Christ. I understand that. You hear that word, ooh, disciple, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'll follow, but it's, you know, only till it gets hard. You know, <laughs> that's, that's really, I mean, really, the word dis disciple is, so, sounds intimidating, doesn't it? But let me tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are to be a disciple. And let me say that that is what Jesus called us to do, to be disciples and to make disciples. Matthew 20, 28, 19, and 20 said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What's it say? It says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's how you make disciples. This is important to me. I know you're, you, you've probably heard me say this before. I talk a lot about this because I think this is one of the, raw, the reasons that we have stinky cheese Christians is it's because they have never been discipled. Now, I understand it's hard to be discipled. It is. I mean, one, churches aren't doing it. And two... You know, followers have to get there. All right, they have to show up to church. They have to show up to Bible study. All right, they have to be there in order to be discipled. But many believers, I truly believe, they've never really been discipled. They've never really thought about what is the basics that, as a believer, that I have to that I have to do. I'm a Christian. What are, what does that mean to be a follower? Look what it says: make disciples, teaching them everything that I have commanded. That's it. Now, let me say, that's a, that's a big order. That, that's smaller than the whole Bible, 
but it's still big, all right? It's this much of the Bible, not that much of the Bible, all right? That's a big hunk. And I, and I truly believe that this can be discovered simply by reading through the Gospels and looking through the things that Jesus told us to do. What did Jesus say? Go do this. What did Jesus say? You are to be stinky cheese? No! <laughs> he did tell us to shine. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about being called to shine. I began this series actually probably a year ago. Maybe a little more than a year ago. Maybe some of you remember. Maybe you don't remember at all. And maybe it's good in both cases. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I started a series called The Commands of Christ, and I firmly believe in studying the commands of Christ. I went through seven of them, the ones that I called the big ones. I have those for, on a slide. All right, The big ones of the commands of Christ are repent, Matthew 4. That's part of the, your beginning relationship with Jesus. You repent of sins. Repent. Follow me, Matthew 4 again. That's what it means to, to be a disciple, to follow him. It means I follow him. I, I take steps after him. I pray. Again, following Jesus will involve communication, talking and listening, prayer, Matthew 6. Love the Lord and love your neighbor, Matthew 22. This is what we're to do unless we stink. If we're stinky cheese Christians, we don't love our neighbor very well. We just say mean and nasty stuff, right? All right, make disciples. That's As a follower of Jesus Christ, we're commanded to make disciples. That means we should be in the process of letting people know about Jesus. Amen? Be baptized. Matthew 28, again, that was right there in this opening verse. Part of being a disciple is you make a decision to take a step, and you say, you know what? The very first thing that Jesus did in his ministry was be baptized. He baptized those that followed him. He baptized the disciples. He had one of his disciples baptize him. He taught people to be baptized. And he said, to be a follower means to be baptized. It's the first step. Be baptized. Pretty easy stuff. We're not even going to go into those because I did them last year. I truly believe and I, that God wants me to do this every year until I die. I, I just, I, unless God changes my mind, I'm planning on doing six or seven commands of Christ a year till I die. Because discipleship isn't something that you'll ever be done with. Amen? These are, these are powerful, powerful commands of Jesus that we should always be looking at. Right? For some of you senior saints, you know, because you've read Matthew before. Right? Can I get an amen? Yeah. You've read this before, but it's still valuable, isn't it? Yeah, we keep reading it. We just keep rereading it. In fact, you know, it's, I, I love, I don't, I'm just distracting myself. I love some of the stories of some of, uh, of some of the persecuted saints who would sneak into a, a jail cell, a singular page of the Bible, a singular page, and they would just study that page and memorize that page and the blessing that would come out of a singular page of Scripture. It's powerful. It's powerful. The Word of God is worth taking another look at and taking another look at because it is living and active because it is the Word of God. And when the Word of God speaks, it changes us. Amen? Amen? All right, so I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. Um, like I said, we're going to do about seven commands of Christ before Christmas, all right? Maybe I might have to take a break and do some uh, Christmas stuff because I, I like Christmas and I can't just not do Christmas stuff. So I will take a break from the commands of Christ when we get close to Christmas. But uh, this, is, this is where we're going to be. And we're really probably going to stay in the Sermon on the Mount because the Sermon on the Mount is just this huge section of powerful Scripture. All right, Matthew chapter 5 is the Beatitudes, but this whole section uh, is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest sermon that Jesus preached. It's three straight chapters, and he just hits all kinds of topics. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. All right, seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened up his mouth, and he taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I'm trying to say it like I think Jesus would say it. Right? I'm just, that's how you hear it in my mind. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely for my account. Rejoice, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now maybe you read that like I read that, and you go, What? <laughs> Like, do you read that? I mean, really, sometimes this, this is very churchy sounding, and this is stuff you've heard in church so many times. It just sounds like, you know, kind of religious gobbledygook. And you go, really? I mean, I mean, really, if you read it for what it says, look, I mean, so let me hear you, Jesus. You're saying, blessed are the persecuted, are the peacemakers, and the poor. Those are the guys that are blessed. Really? <laughs> I mean, really, that doesn't sound right. This whole section, I mean, really, what is this? Blessed are those who persecute, persecute for righteousness' sake when others revile you and persecute you and, and they utter all kinds of evil things against you. You're blessed. That's right where you want to be. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, if we read this and we take the church hat off, you go, like, what? <laughs> like, what are you trying to say? Now, the answer, when, when you have those inner thoughts, like I have when I'm reading the scripture, the answer's there. We just haven't gotten to it yet, okay? Almost always, the answer is in the context. Either the answer is, you started in the middle, or you need to keep reading. And in this case, we, needed, we need to keep reading. So let's read 13 through 16, and that will help us. It'll help us get there. You are salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under men's people's feet. You are light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. Do you have your Bibles with you? I see you're looking down. Good. Can you read that with me? Let's read that together. Let your light shine before others or men, depending on what you have. So that they may <clears throat> so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now see, see this is it. This is where this is what you look for. You look for the action word, right? When this whole section, blessed are, blessed, 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 blessed are all these people that don't sound that very blessed. But then we get to the end, and what does he really say? The command, the crux of it, the affirmative is what? Let your light shine. It's all attached to that. Let your light shine. Very, very, very simply, Jesus said, followers of Jesus Christ, shine. Followers of Jesus Christ, shine. Followers of Jesus Christ, shine. Please hear this. Followers of Jesus Christ, shine like a city on a hill. You remember the first time you ever saw a really big city in the distance at night? Maybe Chicago, maybe LA, maybe New York. I mean, just, it just lights up the sky like there's like a nuclear bomb, right? I remember living in Chicago, how amazing it was to me. It, it happens here in Columbus, too. You look north and you can see the light. But in Chicago, it's crazy. Like the light is just like, brrr, it's like half the sky is always, at least we live probably, I don't know, we live like six miles north of the city. And the light was just like, it was like half of the sky was lit up. It was just like full moon always over there. That was just the way it was because the city was so bright. He says, a city on a hill is meant to be seen. A lamp in your house is meant to be seen. And in the same way, a follower of Jesus Christ is meant to shine. We're meant to shine. So how do I shine? That's the question. That's the real question we should be asking. Because that's, what, that's the affirmative say. That's what Jesus is telling me to do. He's saying, I want you to shine. Do I just smile a lot? Am I shining now? Is this what? Now, some of you could smile a little more. I'm just saying, <laughs> you could smile a little more, all right? That would be a good way to start a little shining. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not what he's uh, talking about at all. What he is saying is that we're, when we are blessed, we shine. 
Oh, now we have an attachment. What did he say every time he gave an attitude? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who mourn. And I started thinking about that. I started thinking about shining this week and its attachment to blessing. You shine when you know you're blessed. I don't know if you've thought about that before. I never thought about it before. But when you know that you're blessed, we shine. When you understand blessing, and when you understand your blessing, we shine. Think about the moments. This is what I was trying to think about. When I was thinking about shining, I started to think in my, I thought in my life, I thought, when have I seen people who shine? You know? Like, what people have really just like, I mean, like their face was like on fire, just like, they were just like radiant with beauty and, and warmth and the sun. And like, when have I seen that? And, there are you, and maybe you have seen that on a few people in your life. I, I don't have that many people. No, I haven't seen that that many times. But I have. There have been moments where you see certain people and they're just like, I mean, you just tell there's something changed about them. And it's not always a spiritual thing. It's just, it's attached to blessing. It's attached to blessing. I have this picture. I have this picture on my desk, or actually on the bookshelf next to my desk, as a picture of Katie. And this is a picture of Katie when we brought home our first son, Noah. It's the most beautiful picture of my wife that's ever been taken. It is a, it is a picture of a mother holding a, like a newborn baby. He wasn't a newborn, but that's what it's like. It's radiant. There's not a more beautiful picture in my, in my heart, in my life, than this one. A mother with that child shines, amen? You've seen pictures like this. You have pictures like this, right? A father in that moment that they are so proud of their son or daughter, they shine, don't they? That moment. And they just, they're just so proud of what their son, what their, what their daughter has done. They shine. In that moment when that student has graduated high school or college, they just got the biggest, cheesiest grin on their face you've ever seen. They're shining. They're just, they're just, they're just so proud. It's, it's, there are these moments when you realize that People shine because they have been blessed when they close the deal. Their face lights up. When they receive the promotion, they come home. They tell you. They tell the family. They tell friends what God has done for them. And they shine. Amen? Think about the day you accepted Jesus Christ. Through the tears, your face shines. Amen? It's just, it's, it, you know, there's nothing like seeing someone receive Jesus Christ because it's, it, there's just a change. There's just a change that happens on their countenance. It's just, it's immediate. Sometimes they weep and they smile all at the same time. Sometimes they just hug everyone. But no matter what, they smile. They just can't help but not. They just smile. Like God has done something. They are blessed and they understand they're blessed. See, the problem is that so often we stop understanding we're blessed. And when we don't understand we're blessed, we stop shining. I, did a, I tried to do a study years ago on John. John, as a disciple, was called the beloved disciple. The beloved. You familiar with him? Right? Now, I wanted to know why it was that Jesus called John the beloved disciple. Why? Why was he so loved? And in the end, it was selfish. I was like, how can I, be, I want to be the beloved disciple. I want to be that guy. So I was like, I'm going to find out what made John so special. And I was just really studying the book of John. Why is he beloved? Why do I want to know? What did he do? Then I realized Jesus never called him the beloved disciple. You know who called John the beloved disciple? John! 
Not, not even the disciple. John calls himself the beloved disciple over and over. He refer, the, the book of John is the book that refers to him as the beloved disciple. You won't find it in Matthew. You don't find it in Mark. So who wrote down the book of John? John! <laughs> John refers to himself as the beloved disciple. He understands what? He understands his blessing. He understands who he is to Jesus. And he's shining. By calling himself the beloved disciple, John, for all of eternity, is saying, Jesus really, really, really likes me. And you know what? You can say that too. You can say the same thing, but we don't. Why not? Jesus really, 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 really likes you. And you can say that. And it's true. Because he died on the cross for you. That's a beautiful truth. And it shines. So we're going to talk about this shining. And I'm going to tell you that the attitudes in the Beatitudes, there are eight of them. We're only going to get through four. They are all about shining. They're all about receiving blessing and understanding blessing. And when we understand that we are blessed, we shine. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. All right. <laughs> Verse uh, verse 3 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now again, the spirit sometimes is confusing to folks because they say, well, the, the, what does that even mean, the spirit? All right, the Bible talks of a spirit and a soul. Now, I won't pretend to understand everything about the spirit and the soul, but I do understand this. Your soul is like who you are. That's you. You are a soul. But you have a spirit. Now that makes sense when you think about it, because like alcohol has a spirit, right? We call alcohol a spirit. So it, and it is a spirit that changes you. Your spirit changes, and you know that, because some days you wake up and you know, oh, I am, <laughs> I'm not in a good mood. I woke up on the bad side of the spirit bed, right? I have a different spirit, a different countenance, right? I have a different feel today. You can have a lying spirit. You can have an evil spirit. You can have a deceptive. These are, these are terms that are used in the scripture. You can have a spirit of you, a character of you that is this, and then it can be changed. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. So he's, what he's saying, he's saying, blessed are those that are poor or they don't have much of the spirit of themselves. Blessed are people who are not full of themselves. That's what he's saying. He's saying, blessed are people who are empty of self. We know a lot of people that are full of, uh, full of it, right? You know a lot of people that are full of it. I like the little <laughs> over there. <laughs> Thank you for entertaining me. I mean, we, we, a lot of people are full of themselves, and Jesus says, look, you're to be empty of yourself because you're to be full of not your spirit. We don't want the spirit of Tim. We don't want the spirit of Tyler. We don't want the spirit of Michael. No, no, no. I am to be full, according to Ephesians 5.18, I'm to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command. That's a, an affirmative. You need to work on this because all the time, my, my flesh is like, I think you need a little more Tim. A little less Jesus. You pour some of that out. A little more Tim in there. That'd do you real good. And it doesn't ever work out real well. Amen? We're to be empty of self. Empty of self. We shine when we are empty of self. That's my first one. If you can put that up there. There it is. Empty of self. Oh, we got three now. Is that what I've made? What, what happened? <laughs> Tell the truth. You messed with my slides. Just, uh, just, just. <laughs> You change the font. All right, well, that's just our first point, but now you're ahead of me. That's fine. We'll just leave it right there. Empty of self, all right? We are called to be humble. We are called to be empty of us. A little less of you, a little more of Jesus. Secondly, verse uh, 4, blessed are those who mourn. What? Blessed are those who mourn. How? <laughs> really? I don't want to be sad, Jesus. I am not looking to be happy. I mean, I am not looking to be crying. I don't want to cry. I don't want to be sad. I don't want any of that. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Why? What is Jesus trying to convey to us? Broken. A brokenness. A brokenness of sin. There are things in this world 
that we should be broken about. There are things that you ought to cry about. Now, I know this whole world wants to entertain itself into being, you know, grinning idiots from birth to grave. But let me tell you, there are things that you should be broken about. I mean, really, come on. I know you don't want to feel those things. And we are in a society that all, is all about the painkiller. We don't want to feel pain. Amen. No. <laughs> we don't want to experience loss and we don't want to be hurt about the things going on in your life and my life. We would much rather rather ignore them. Amen. Because if we ignore it, maybe we don't have to feel it. But Christ is saying, you know what? You shine the most when you will be broken about that sin. When you will be broken when you will hurt with the hurting, you shine. Think about that. Think about that person that maybe visited you in the hospital. They had nothing to say. I visit people in the hospitals. I think it's a joy and a privilege as a pastor to go to someone in the hospital or to go to someone at their house after a surgery or whatever. I don't have any magic words. I mean, I pray and we pray for, I pray for peace and I pray for comfort and I pray for healing. And Jesus either gives it or he doesn't. But in the end, the truth is, is the greatest thing that I can do is simply be there. Just be there. And sometimes cry with a friend and say, I know it hurts. I know this stinks. And we need that, don't we? We need people that will be real enough to be broken over sin. The people that will be real enough to be broken and say, you know what? Some of this stuff stinks. And I can't stand it. And it hurts me. It hurts me to think that I, ha I know people that are, refuse to believe in Jesus Christ and are heading to hell. That breaks my heart. And if we're not broken about that, then we're, there's something wrong with us. I mean, if we're not broken about babies that are losing their lives because they're a nuisance, when there are parents all over the world that were dying to have children... There's something wrong, and we ought to be broken about that. We ought to be broken. It's, it's, that's sin, and it's just terrible. We ought to be broken about, you know, that we have the fact that we have missionaries and Christians in other countries that are literally running for their lives. We ought to be broken for that. We ought to be broken for the stuff that we see on the TV and on the radio. We ought to hear this stuff, and they're pushing it on you like it's entertainment. And we ought to be strong enough to say, that's not funny. I don't care how many laugh tracks you put on that. It's not funny. It's awful. Just because you play people laughing in the background doesn't change this. This is hurtful. This is mean. This is cruel. This is nasty. And I just have to be broken over it. I won't be entertained by it. We need to be broken over sin. We need to be broken over sin. Thirdly, blessed are those, I'm sorry, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this scripture was taken right out of Psalms uh, 37, 11, which says, the meek shall possess the land and, and, uh, and <clears throat> the meek shall possess the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Now, we don't use meek very often. It's not a word that you and I, do you ever say meek? Anyone? Ever. You do? Usually in referring to the Bible. Really? You, okay, well that's that. Controlled strength. You know what a good word for meek is? In, in common language, in fact, a lot of translations don't even use meek because common language today, we don't use meek. They just use gentle. Gentle. Gentleness. That we would be gentle. And that is a good definition. I always, I tell my boys that strength is controlled power, right? That's what, you know, if you're strong, you're capable of doing something without being out of control. Amen? And I, that's, that's, that's the point, right? There's a control here, a gentleness. Blessed are those that are gentle. But again, what do you mean blessed are those that are gentle? But see, again, the blessing is the shining. The shining is the blessing. And we are blessed and we shine when we're gentle. Understand, I am not a gentle person by nature. 
Thank you for not saying amen. <laughs> I spent my whole life, especially my childhood, hurting people. I did. I had an older brother <laughs> who was four years older than me. And so I was able to just fight him and wrestle with him as hard as I could. because He's four years older, right? Just like my son David does to me. My son David fights me like I'm a, like a saber-toothed tiger. I mean, he just comes at me. I swear my kidney was bleeding the other day. He just got me so good. Like, Pah! I was like, are you kidding me? You're six. This is insane. I just, I, I, it was like, he just goes at it. Now, not, not my son Noah. He's different. My son Noah is gentle. He, he does not want to hurt me. They're the same size and shape. They, like, I mean, they, same, they weigh the same. They're just as strong as each other. They're, they're very, very similar. But Noah is gentle because he is concerned that daddy could get hurt. And one time that he did hurt me and he bawled his eyes out. He's gentle. We're commanded. Understand the scriptures commands us to be gentle. Not only that, Galatians Galatians 5, 23 says that gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It is evidence, fruit, that the Spirit of God lives in you. Gentleness. There's the scripture. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Gentle. We are called to be gentle. And I know so many Christians say stuff like, well, you know, that's just not who I am. It doesn't matter who you are. Remember what we said? A little less of you, a little more Jesus. Yeah, thank you. One amen. How about a couple more amens? A little less of you, a little more Jesus. We need to be gentle. We need to control our strength. And for, I know that doesn't have to do with just being strong. That has to do with our mouths. That has to do with our demeanor. That has to do with everything on who we are. That's how we shine, by being gentle with people. By being careful with people, by loving people, we need to be gentle. Understand, everybody in this room is hurting. Each and every one of you, you have open wounds. You have scars that are just moments from being torn open. So do I. I, I mean, really, let's be honest. We're all just a sentence or two away from tears. We have to be gentle with people. Because we should be filled with the Spirit of God and we should love people and we should be concerned how they feel. We should be concerned what they hear. Gentleness. Shine through gentleness. We don't live in a gentle age. Jesus was, is telling you, be gentle. Lastly, we're only get, going to get through four this week. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. I love the, that, that, that description, hunger and thirst. And maybe you've been on a, like a long hike. I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's something I would do. I'd go on a hike and I'd take no water. <laughs> you get halfway into the hike and you go, this was a mistake. <laughs> I'm two miles from anywhere. <laughs> and you're like dying. You're just like, I need a drink. Have you ever done that? Am I the only person that's gone on a hike and not taking water? All right, well, it's happened to me, and perhaps you've been in a moment where you're really thirsty or you're really hungry, right? Has that ever happened? Remember that, feel that, it's, 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 it's tangible. Thirst and hunger. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, the, for right acting of God. Hmm, that's descriptive. Blessed are people who hunger and thirst for God to move. For God to move and to act rightly in my life and in this world and in this community. Blessed are people who want it. That's a, oh, that's a description. Do you want God to move? Do you want God to move in your life? Now, I've told you, that this is a description of shining. But it's also a description of being blessed. For some of you, for some of you, it's enough that I would tell you tonight that Jesus wants you to shine. That's a command. And if you want to shine, you should do these things. We should have the character of mourning. We should have the character of being empty of self and broken of sin and gentle with others and be thirsty for God. That's what Jesus wants you to do. And for some of us, we just go, then let's do it. 
Now, for others, maybe you're like, I don't know, that sounds hard. You know, I want to be a follower, but that's that disciple thing again. That sounds like discipline. Let me just say it this way. What does he say each and every time? He says, blessed. Do you want blessing? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, one of you, wants a, who wants a blessing from God? Raise your hand if you want a blessing from God. He is describing what it means to be blessed. To be blessed by God looks like this. And if you're blessed, then you shine. And if we shine, then we are people who are blessed and understand our blessing. See, Jesus is calling you to be empty of self, to be broken of sin, to be gentle with others, and to be thirsty for God. And if you want more blessing, that is what we'll do. And I think for some of us, maybe that's what we just need to think about that. Do I have the attitude of a blessed person? Do I have the attitude of someone that shines? Do those descriptions sound like you? Hmm. Let's just allow God to speak to us for a minute. We're just going to just pray right now. Just bow your heads and let's just think about these, these four areas of our lives. Just bow your head. Put your attention on God. God, do I need to be more empty of myself? Do I need a little more of you and a little less of me? Do I need to be broken of sin? Because have I become comfortable with sin? Do I need to mourn a little bit more for the sins of this world? Do I need to be more gentle with those around me? Do I need to be more concerned with people's feelings and hurts? Do I need to be thirsty? Do I need to become thirsty for God? To want God to move in righteous ways? I know God is speaking to your heart because He's been speaking to mine all week in this powerful section of Scripture. And just allow him to speak and respond. Commit to him now. Say, God, I want your blessing. God, I want to shine. I want people, when they meet me and when they come into my presence, to feel you radiate from my life. I don't know what area it is for me, for you. Maybe it's all four areas. Maybe for you, you go, I need to be a little less self-fulfilled, a little less self-focused, and I need a little more Christ. I need to be a little more broken of my sin. I need to be a little more gentle with others. Maybe I need to be a little more thirsty for God. Maybe it's just one of those, and God is just being loud and speaking into your heart and saying, I want you to change some things in this area but allow him to say those things to you. Whatever he is saying, allow him to speak. And respond by saying, God, you can have it. I will focus less on myself. I will be broken of sin. I'll be more gentle with people. And I'll be more thirsty for you. For your glory, let each and every one of us shine like the sun. That your blessing would be poured out over this church and over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're going to be dismissed because I think we're done in the back.
So, but I want to encourage you tonight. We're not going to do our, our, our closing song. Um, but I want to encourage you to go from this place shining. Shining. And allow people to see you shine. God bless. Go enjoy some uh, cookies and some Kool-Aid in the back. And tell Jody how much you love her and how much you'll miss her.